would you do if there's another global financial meltdown? It's a serious question. I think one that most people would rather avoid just because of how serious it is. But Jim Rickards is not avoiding it. He's written a book about what he thinks will be the world's financial quagmire. The book is called Aftermath, and his goal, as the title implies, is to help people deal with what might become a very, very dangerous situation. What's going on here? Why is it important for you to hear about it? Discover on this episode of Cotto Gottfried, where, of course, Rickards joins us. I'm your co-host, Joseph Ward Cotto. My co-host, Paul Gottfried, will not be joining us this time. In your book, Aftermath, you believe you write quite a bit about a new financial crisis, but you don't believe it will be apocalyptic. I think a lot of people, when they envision any kind of financial crisis, apocalypse is probably one of the first words that come to mind, other than some ones we can't <laughs> say on camera right now. <laughs> uh, but why is it that you think the next financial crisis will not be a sort of Armageddon scenario? Well, it's a great question. I'll, I'll leave the apocalypse to others. You know, when you're in uh, my position as a writer, public speaker, uh, analyst, and so forth, uh, and I'm pretty active on social media. A lot of people want to put words on your mouth, words in your mouth, and they'll say, "Well, you know, Jim Rickards is saying the world's coming to an end. Sell everything and buy gold." Uh, I've never said any one of those things. I, I don't believe it. I don't think the world's coming to an end. Or if it is, that's not my uh, uh, that's not my branch of predictive analytics. Uh, I would never. Uh, say sell everything. And I, I do recommend gold for part of your portfolio, but a fairly modest part, about 10% should never go in all in on any one asset class. So as I say, we'll leave the apocalypse to others, but um, I do forecast and I expect with uh, good reason, uh, another financial catastrophe worse than 2008 um, and maybe bad enough, in fact, likely bad enough so that the aftermath, and that's part of where the title aftermath comes from, will leave us in a very different world. So is it the end of the world? No. Uh, but is it likely to be a changed world in one or more ways? The answer is yes. Uh, and the reasons for that, and again, it's not just speculation. I use um, uh, science in my predictive analytics. Uh, I blend a number of branches of science, uh, a, a lot of emphasis on physics and complexity theory in particular, um, but also uh, applied mathematics, uh, uh, Bayesian uh, statistics, uh, Bayes rule, um, I use behavioral psychology as applied to economics, or economic behavior, uh, and finally history, uh, which I, I consider can be a science uh, and also has obviously a lot of valuable lessons. So take those four branches of science, uh, complexity theory, applied mathematics, uh, behavioral psychology, and uh, history, that's my toolkit, and I use that to make the forecast. And just to kind of you know wrap up a little bit on on that point, um, I've written about, studied, and, and actually lived through uh, sometimes with a front row seat, even though that was a little uncomfortable, uh, a succession of financial crises. But in particular, 1998, uh, August September 1998, that was when Russia defaulted on its internal and external debt devalue the ruble, started a global liquidity crisis, which then spread very quickly, but landed um, in my lap. I was the general counsel of uh, long-term capital management. That was the hedge fund uh, based in Greenwich, Connecticut, that was uh, at risk of um, basically going uh, going bankrupt. We had, we had lost uh, upwards of $4 billion in about uh, less than a month. Um, that by itself was not the end of the world. That was sort of too bad for uh, the investors, which are mostly ourselves, uh, over two and a half billion of that was our money. So, you know, some uh, we managed the fund and we suffered most of the losses. So that's uh, not unfair. But uh, nobody thought that they should bail, that they, meaning the Fed or Wall Street, should bail out a hedge fund. We did not expect a bailout. We weren't asking for a bailout. It was sort of, um, you know, on us. But uh, in addition to the lost capital, we had one point. Four trillion dollars uh, notional value of derivatives with 50 or so Wall Street banks. And the real danger is not that we lost money, which we did, but that we would uh, go to zero and and basically disappear from the 1.4 trillion dollars of swaps, which would have left Wall Street 
with a one-sided position. You know, when Wall Street banks sold us a position, they sold the opposite side of that position to somebody else. So they were they were looking at net risk, not not the gross amount, but the net amount because they had a long and a short. The problem with that is when you when you take one side of the uh, you have a match book of longs and short, take one side of the out, uh, take it away because of default. All of a sudden, you go from a net position to a gross position. Uh, just in equities, for example, we had fifteen billion dollars of equity positions. Imagine Wall Street trying to go out and and dump fifteen billion dollars of stock all in one morning. I mean, it would have closed the New York Stock Exchange. So that was one um, crisis. It was resolved with the Fed bringing the major banks together to put in $4 billion of capital, basically buy the balance sheet and do an orderly re, uh, unwind over the course of a year. Flash forward 10 years to uh, 2008. And again, I don't have to recite the whole history. I think people are still pretty familiar with that. It's fresh in a lot of people's minds. Uh, but here, it wasn't a hedge fund that went down. It was Wall Street. Uh, March 2008, Bear Stearns failed. June and July uh, 2008, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac failed. September 2008, Lehman Brothers failed. Morgan Stanley was just a few days behind. We were we were witnessing the sequential collapse of every major Wall Street bank. It would have been Goldman, you know, Morgan Stanley, Goldman, Citi, et cetera. Uh, and the Federal Reserve truncated that. Now they didn't get the banks together to bail out the banks. The, the central banks had to bail out the banks, bail out Wall Street, in other words. The problem is that none of the issues have been addressed. None of the um, the regulations, the rules, the laws, the behavior, et cetera, that govern capital markets have been addressed in such a way as to prevent these calamities from happening over and over again. So 2008, sorry, 1998, Wall Street bails out a hedge fund. 2008, the central banks bail out Wall Street. My question is, in the next crisis, who's going to bail out the central banks? As I say, the problem hasn't gone away. It's just moved from you know hedge funds to Wall Street to the central banks. But all that debt, all that leverage, uh, the artificially low interest rates, all that risk is now on the balance sheets of the central banks. How do they unwind it? How do they get rid of it? Uh, and in particular, they, they had started to, but it raised the issue, which I pointed to years ago. Uh, they're getting ready. They, the Fed and other central banks are trying to get ready for the next recession. They want to get interest rates up to around three or four percent so they can cut them if they have to. They want to get the balance sheet down to about two trillion so they can do more money printing if they have to. The question is, how do you get there without causing the recession you're preparing to cure? That's the conundrum. My view is they couldn't do it. And we learned at the end of December 2018 that that's, in fact, the case. Jay Powell the, of the Federal Reserve threw in the towel. They started cutting rates. They started printing money again um, as a way of saying we can't get back to normal. There's literally no exit. Uh, name of another good book, by the way. Uh, but there's uh, there's no exit. They can't uh, get enough dry powder for the next recession. They're not ready for the next recession. They're heading back to zero rates. They're doing more QE. Uh, they painted themselves into a corner they can't get out of. And when the crisis arrives, which it inevitably will, uh, they won't. They'll be ill-prepared. They're going to have to just shut, shut the stock exchanges and shut the banks. The things that they narrowly avoided in 1998 and 2008, they're going to have to do the next time. What do you think will? Uh, hard to ask the question, but in speaking about what you believe will be the next financial crisis, you said there's going to be great change that comes about as a result of that. More than anything else, what do you think the most uh, major change will be? Well, a couple of things. Number one, uh, the issue is how do you uh, how do you deal with a crisis? And the dynamics of a financial crisis, a global liquidity crisis, and the mathematics behind those dynamics are identical to similar phenomena we see in nature. Uh, and uh, in, in fact, uh, you know, financial experts or financial risk managers, you hear the word contagion thrown around a lot. So, you know, in the example I gave. You know, Bear Stearns failed and then Lehman Brothers failed. And, you know, Morgan Stanley was next. AIG uh, was failing, had to be bailed out. So that's an example of financial contagion, the disease, if you will, the liquidity crisis spreading from bank to bank, but actually uh, in an exponential way. Well, that's exactly how real disease is spread, you know, whether it's Ebola or the, the influence, influenza um, uh, 
epidemic or pandemic of 1919. Uh, it starts out, you know, as patient zero and they infect two people and then four and 16 and 64 and you just take something exponentially and before long you're into, it doesn't take long to get into millions and billions. Um, that's how a, a, a pandemic spreads and that's how a financial panic spreads. Now, uh, and you see similar phenomena in earthquakes, uh, volcanic eruptions, uh, tidal waves, uh, forest fires, and other kinds of natural phenomena, avalanches. The difference is that in a natural system, such as you know an avalanche or an earthquake or a volcano, it happens, and there's no way to truncate it. You cannot stop a, a volcano from erupting. You cannot stop uh, an earthquake once it begins. But in a man-made system, there are things you can do. You can truncate the crisis, uh, which is exactly what the Federal Reserve did in, in 2008. Um, they, you know, we know, well known, they took interest rates to zero, kept them there for six years until, uh, seven years actually, until 2015. They printed uh, over $3 trillion of money uh, under these programs, QE, QE2, QE3, and so forth. Um, but less well remembered is the fact that the Federal Reserve, working with the FDIC, guaranteed every bank deposit in America. There was a $250,000 insurance limit. So, yeah, the first $250,000 is, uh, is insured, federally insured. But a lot of people, you know, small businesses or wealthy individuals have a million or maybe $2 million in the bank or even more. Uh, and they were taking their money out because it wasn't guaranteed. Well, the Fed came along and said, it's all guaranteed, regardless of size. They then guaranteed every money market fund in America. There was no, that's a trillion dollar industry. There was no need to do that, no requirement to do that. But again, people were taking their money out of the money market fund. So the Fed felt they had to guarantee it. And something that was not known at all at the time, only came out years later, uh, was that a very similar, again, contagion at work a similar liquidity crisis was going on in Europe among the European banks. They had loaned dollars. Well, where did they get the dollars to loan? Well, they, they issued dollar liabilities, commercial paper, short-term CDs, notes, et cetera. Well, who were the buyers of those? It was the money market funds by and large. So when the money market funds had to sell assets to pay off their, uh, their shareholders, um, they refused to buy new assets from the European bank, which banks, which meant the European bank funding, dried up and they needed dollars and they turned to their central bank. Uh, well, there's only one problem. The European central bank doesn't print dollars. It prints euros. Uh, only the fed can print dollars. So what happened was the fed printed up $10 trillion and the European central bank printed up 10 trillion euros approximately. And they swapped. So the fed got the euros ECB European central bank got the dollars and then they could provide money to their own banks. Well, this was all, um, th this was all unprecedented. I want to be clear. This is not the way you deal with a business cycle recession or prior panics. None of this had ever happened in the history of the Federal Reserve, 106 year uh, uh, history at this point. So, um, so there was that kind of intervention, what I call trunca truncation. It's as if you had an avalanche, you know, and then a steel wall popped up out of the mountain and, and the avalanche stopped. Of course, there, were all, there are no steel walls on mountains. Uh, you can't stop an avalanche, but but you could stop the financial panic. But but the point is, how are you going to stop the next one? And with the central banks out of dry powder, my view is that they'll actually have to close the banks and close the exchanges, reprogram the ATMs, so you can get maybe three hundred dollars a day for gas and groceries. But that's it. Uh, and then they'll say, "We'll get back to you." They'll they'll just close everything. When I say things like that. People go, oh, you know, you're, you're making it up. That would never happen. No, every one of those things has happened. People don't understand uh, the outbreak of World War One from July 1914 to December 1914. The New York Stock Exchange was closed for five months, not five days or five weeks, five months. In 1933, uh, President Roosevelt, FDR, issued an executive order, closed every bank in America, just said closed. And didn't say when they would reopen. Turned out it was eight days later, but no one knew that at the time. They just said, hey, the bank's closed. We'll get back to you. Um, in uh, uh, 2013 in Cyprus, they closed the banks. 2015 in Greece, they closed the banks and you could not use a debit card or a credit card and they turned off the ATMs. And people in Athens were flying to Frankfurt, Germany with empty suitcases and loading them up with 
paper euros and flying back to Athens so they could have money because, as they say, credit cards, debit cards, ATMs didn't work, banks were closed. So these things happen, and some of them have happened very recently, and uh, they don't happen lightly. But but my point is, if the next crisis is bigger, which it will be, and if the central bank is not prepared to truncate it, which it will not be because we already saw that they can't get back to normal, they're going to have no alternative, at least in the short run, but to close everything. Um, I referred to, for, referred to this in one of my books as uh, Ice Nine. I'm sure you're familiar with Kurt Vonnegut's book, uh, Cat's Cradle. A uh, great book, by the way, short, uh, dark humor, very funny, but serious at the same time. Um, that involved uh, an isotope of water invented by some genius physicist, uh, but had two characteristics. One was uh, it was uh, frozen at room temperature. Uh, and the other one was if it came into contact with water, the water molecule would turn into ice nine. So if you, if you pour this into a stream, the stream would freeze, the harbor would freeze, the ocean would freeze, the planet would freeze, and life on Earth would die. So it was a doomsday machine. Um, and uh, so I took that, uh, you know, credit to Kurt Vonnegut for the story, but I, I took that and applied it to capital markets again, as an answer to contagion, you know, one bank fails, another bank fails, the panic spreads, the exchange closes, uh, you know, et cetera. As ICE-9, you're going to have to freeze the entire global financial system to deal with that panic. Well, I, I promise you when you come out of that light, the, the world will not be the same. Before I ask the next question, just have to say, it's fascinating how relevant Kurt Vonnegut could be to so many things that yeah. I don't think even he would have foreseen. Uh, anyhow, though, uh, talking about cryptocurrency, that's something which today is all the rage. You, however, are skeptical of it, to say the least. And uh, you know, cryptocurrency is a broad thing to discuss. So I'll just first ask, we'll discuss the two big ones. So I'll first ask about Bitcoin. What are your issues with Bitcoin in relation to the modern global economy? Well, Bitcoin has no role in the modern global economy. It, uh, it might have a residual value of about $200 a coin as a token for criminals, tax evaders, terrorists, you know, child pornographers, people who uh, can't, you know, kind of show their face in more com commerce. But other than that, it's, um, it's a gambling mechanism. I mean, if, if I sell you Bitcoin, uh, or you sell me Bitcoin, we're just making a bet. One of us thinks it's going down, the other one thinks it's going up. But there's no there's no value out of it. People say, well, wait a second. Uh, you know, not that long ago, Bitcoin was, you know, $100 a coin. You go back a few years, it was a dollar a coin. Um, and it went to $20,000. Um, there are some legitimate Bitcoin millionaires and maybe Bitcoin billionaires. I know uh, some people who bought a 1,000 Bitcoin for a dollar a piece. They made a $1,000 bet. And they sold out very near the top, around $19,000 per coin. Um, they were good citizens, actually paid their taxes, and walked away with uh, you know $12 million net on a $1,000 bet. Uh, and that's real money. They actually did make the money. But I point out that, I will say, where did that money come from? It, you know, you take Bill Gates, for example. Bill Gates is worth, you know, I don't know, $80, 90000000000 billion dollars. Uh, but he earned every penny of it. He invented a new operating system. He made the, the personal computer usable. He created untold trillions of dollars of wealth around the world by adding to productivity and enhancing people's skills and amplifying people's skills, improving communication, et cetera. Well, if his share of, of that was $80 billion for creating trillions of wealth uh, through productivity, good for him. That He, he earned it. Um, but when you make money on Bitcoin, you didn't earn it. You took it from somebody else. And the somebody else are like a South Korean garage mechanic who hawked his inventory and bought the Bitcoin at $18,000 and has since lost his life savings. And, and, and there's a certain number of suicides resulting from this. So if you're at ease, if you're comfortable, if you can sleep at night making your money by basically taking it from people who can't afford it, taking it from people who got caught up in the euphoria, fine. I'm not personally comfortable with that. Again, if you if you earn it, make all you want, that's that's fine. But Bitcoin's a zero sum game, maybe even a negative sum game because there are frictions. As far as being money is concerned, um, I, I often say that the people who design these cryptocurrencies, they're very, very good developers and applied mathematicians and awful monetary economists. They don't know anything about monetary economics. 
Um, and I'll give you a very concrete example. So, you know, Nakamoto, Nakamoto, Satoshi, Satoshi Nakamoto, I guess, the inventor of Bitcoin, whoever he, she, or it is, and query whether it's not a high tech classified team working inside of Raytheon or Lockheed to invent the whole thing to suck up all the information in the world, you know, stay tuned on that. But uh, whoever it was, they had an axe to grind with central banks. You know, the, and, and this was, this is public. There were some postings to this effect by the inventor uh, that, you know, pointing to central bank money printing. We hate that. And so they designed Bitcoin to have a ceiling on the number of coins. They said, we want to get away from a world where you can print unlimited amounts of money uh, there are only a certain number of Bitcoin. I believe the number is 24 million or perhaps 22 million, somewhere in there. But that, that there's a hard ceiling on the number of Bitcoin that you can produce. And we're actually getting close to that ceiling right now. Well, what's wrong with that? Well, here's what's wrong. Money supply can't have a ceiling or shouldn't have a ceiling. It needs to grow in line with the economy. And if your economy is growing 2 or 3% a year, then your money supply needs to grow two or three or four percent a year in order to uh, accommodate the increased commerce that comes from that expanding economy. Now, that could be abused. Granted, if you know you should increase the money supply modestly and you increase the money supply radically and furthermore change inflation expectations, yeah, you can get some inflation. You can get hyperinflation as, as we've seen in Venezuela uh, and elsewhere. So I'm not saying that uh, central banking is a perfect system. It, it's not, but the solution is not to cap the number of uh, uh, coins or monetary units. The reason for that is if you do that, so imagine, so the economy keeps growing, but the number of units is capped with a hard ceiling. Well, let's say it were in general use as, um, as a currency or medium of exchange, what would happen? Each unit would become more valuable. That's called deflation. It's a bad thing. When your money is worth more, that's deflationary. And here's the problem. A monetary system and an economy is not, it might be based on money supply, but that's not how it operates. It operates through credit. It's all the the, the borrowing, the lending, the the, the bonds, the notes, um, the, the mortgages, uh, all the credit that's piled on top of a certain amount of money. That's what drives the economy. Uh, you know, when you take a mortgage on a house, you don't go down to the Fed and ask them to print some money. You go to the bank and 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 uh, and they create it and you sign the note and that's a form of debt. Well, who wants to borrow in a deflationary currency? If you do that, you owe more than you borrowed. Now, and I'm not talking about interest. Yeah, interest accrues and you pay the interest. I'm saying the money itself that you borrowed is uh, more valuable when you go to pay back the loan than when you took it out. That's what deflation does. Who wants to borrow in that world? Answer, nobody. So you never get the credit creation on top of the money supply that you need. So Bitcoin is is Ill, not just ill-suited, it's completely unsuited to uh, act as a currency because it cannot grow with the economy. It's one of the attractions of gold, by the way. Gold um, is a form of money. Um, and everyone says, well, the gold supply is fixed. No, it's not. I mean, mining output grows about 1.6% a year relative to existing supply. That's quite as high as uh, economic growth, um, but uh, but it's close enough. And uh, central banks can always get more gold from private supplies. If you want to, there's no there's no inconsistency between a discretionary monetary policy and a gold standard. If you want to print money and buy gold, go ahead, but just you know be prepared for the consequences. But central banks can buy all the gold they need from private hands, uh, in addition to mining, and so they can adjust. So the money, no, the money supply is flexible um, uh, in a growing economy, but you can't print gold. So that's why it's it's a lot more suitable. And there are other alternatives we can talk about those. But but and then the last thing with Bitcoin, well, it's not the last thing because it's a long list of flaws. Um, but the the amount of uh, energy that you need to run the computers to solve the math problems to to uh, confirm the next block grows exponentially. Um, Bitcoin mining now uses more electricity than the nation of Ireland uh, each year, but it's it closing in on Japan, the world's uh, third largest economy. So um, does anyone seriously think that the United Nations, the G20, uh, the OECD are going to allow that kind of electricity consumption for a zero to negative sum game that adds nothing to economic value? No. 
So, um, so Bitcoin's a dead end. If you want to, you know, I prefer playing roulette or going to the racetrack if I feel like gambling, but I'm not particularly interested in Bitcoin. Having said that, there are thousands of cryptocurrencies. Uh, last time I looked at one of the exchanges, there were 2,000. They're all different in some in small ways, some in very large ways having to do with governance. How do you validate the blockchain? Um, is it permissioned, uh, which is like joining a club? You actually need permission to join, to participate in it. Is it um, not permissioned, meaning anybody can do it? That's the way Bitcoin is. So there are a lot of questions you have to ask, you know, what, what's the efficiency? What's the electricity usage? What's the governance, permission, non-permission? And what's the use case? So you you have to, it's kind of like stocks. You don't, the stocks are not generic. You analyze each company separately. Um, so I think the blockchain technology is here to stay. Permissioned distributed ledgers in particular uh, have a future. Um, certain cryptocurrencies could be useful depending on their design and use case, uh, but Bitcoin is just not one of them. I was also going to ask about Ethereum, uh, but I suppose maybe the same things one could say about Bitcoin could be said about that, even though, as you said, there are some differences. But before we move on to non-cryptocurrency matters, is there anything you want to say about Ethereum? Well, um, Ethereum, uh, in in theory, um, it can be used for a lot more than currencies. It can be used uh, basically uh, for smart contracts. So I, I really see the, the future... Again, I'd steer away from the cryptocurrency term. I don't see much use for any of it. But if you're talking about distributed ledgers, um, remember, they can record a lot more than currency values. They can record uh, title. So, you know, if you buy a house today, somebody at the closing, some legal assistant or title insurance person takes a deed and marches down to City Hall and files the deed. And, uh, you know, it might be digitally recorded somewhere, but there's a physical paper deed uh, that says you own the house. Um, well, there are lots of uh, uh, transactions like that uh, where title changes hands, stocks, bonds, derivatives, real estate, um, intellectual property, uh, bills of lading, uh, export import transactions, letters of credit, et cetera. They can all be recorded uh, and in my view securely recorded uh, on blockchains. And so the, the I'm very close to this and I'm in touch with uh, – IBM and other companies that are kind of leading the way. Um, this is what they're working on. They're working on using distributed ledger technology as a more efficient way of recording titles, transactions, uh, supply chains, uh, and the movement of goods and services rather than trying to come up with a new currency. A lot of people who are watching this probably think, well, you know, good thing I'm not in cryptocurrency because I have a 401k. And even though the 401k is anything other than a sure bet, which you know, cryptocurrency obviously isn't either, but uh, the 401k is thought of as perhaps the most solid investment the average American can make if he or she wants to have a good retirement. But uh, as you mentioned in your book, there are quite a few pitfalls with regard to 401ks. And you anticipate that during the years to come, these pitfalls will, one might say, be uh, the depth will be greater. And uh, I believe the biggest problem you have is the inflation of the inflated asset prices. Uh, anything you want to share about that? Sure. Um, yeah, as far as inflated asset prices are concerned, uh, the, the, the key there, you know, I once did a, uh, I think my, my second book, The Death of Money, I, I did a public event at the New York Public Library. And, uh, you know, it was open to the public. You just had to kind of sign up and walk in. And uh, you do something like that in New York, you get an interesting crowd. Uh, but there was one, I gave my presentation, we had Q&A, and one gentleman said, uh, well, you know, I, I, I hear you and I, I agree with you, uh, but I have a certain job and I have a 401k. And the only choices in my 401k are stocks and stock funds, you know, index funds, ETFs kind of thing, ETFs type of things, and, uh, and a money market fund. Um, and what do I do? And I thought about it for a second. I said, quit your job because get out of that uh, 401k. I was, it was only half tongue, tongue in cheek. But, but the point is, and, and, and answer your question, um, 401ks have very limited options. You kind of, you can probably buy the company stock or the company you're working for, uh, some index funds, maybe some ETFs, um, and maybe a bond fund and a money market fund. And that's about it. Um, you, may, you can buy safe stuff like treasury bills kind of a cash equivalent, but what you cannot do usually 
um, is private equity, uh, gold, silver, um, real estate, uh, direct plays in natural resources, uh, oil, water, uh, you know, et cetera. Um, and, and those are where the growth is. Those are where uh, the future lies in many respects. So what I don't, one thing I don't like about 401ks is they, they herd you into a, a pretty small pen of uh, index funds and money market funds. And I always say, you know, when, when you're getting ready to slaughter pigs, you have to herd them together before you slaughter them. And I see many uh, respect, many ways in which investors and savers are being herded into a small number of instant, uh, instruments in a small number of institutions, and they're being set up for, for slaughter, either in the, the, the drastic scenario where you close the banks and close the exchanges, or even if it's just savings accounts, you know, what about negative interest rates? Uh, so let's say the central bank or country, we're going to impose negative interest rates. So that means I put $100,000 in the bank. I go away for a year. I come back and I only have $99,000. That's a 1% negative interest rate. They're taking your money away. They're already doing this in Japan, Europe, Switzerland, Sweden, and a few other places. And you know, maybe coming to the United States by this time next year. Well, what's the solution to that? Well, one obvious solution is to go down to the bank with a suitcase and say, hey, give me all my money in cash. I'll take it out, put it in a safe place, go away for a year, come back. Guess what? I still have $100,000. You you couldn't take the negative rate, out, the negative interest rate out because I got it in cash. Uh, by the way, that's easier said than done. But don't don't try taking a lot of cash out of a bank. They'll, they'll tell you they'll tell you to come back a few days later, make an appointment, and uh, they'll they'll file uh, a currency transaction report with the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. We went to a file right next to uh, um, uh, you know Osama bin Laden. So uh, so the, the point that that's not so easy. But the point is, there are many efforts underway led by people like Ken Rogoff, a professor at Harvard, um, to eliminate cash. Uh, and you do hear about, I go to, I met with a number of central bankers and top economists and government officials, and you hear about this all the time. They would love to eliminate cash. Uh, they say it's to, uh, you know, prevent criminality, but the real reason is they want to herd you into a digital pen at a bank, one of a relatively small number of banks, so that you have no alternative. Uh, you can't get physical cash because it won't exist anymore. Um, and this is spreading. I mean, I just got back from, uh, I was doing the the world uh, book tour for for Aftermath and just came back from Vienna and London. And, you know, I went to a bar in London one night and there was a sign, uh, you know, right by the door saying uh, no cash. Uh, so, you know, that's that's their prerogative. If you're running a bar, you can do it any way you like. But this is spreading and uh, regulators favor it, central bankers favor it. But don't uh, don't make any mistake about the reason they want to take your money with negative interest rates and they have to force you into cash to begin with. Now, so the pro one problem of 401k are limited options and the fact that you're, you're locked into a digital system that can be frozen. Uh, and I would expect in the next financial crisis, they are going to freeze money market funds. They last time they guaranteed them and they could do that again. But the other thing they can do is just say, Hey, these things as of now, they're non-redeemable, meaning you can call your broker, but you can't get your money. You know, they're not stealing your money, but they're locking it in. Uh, but another objection, this was a, a different uh, part of the book. This was in uh, chapter three, where I looked into behavioral psychology and uh, a kind of a scary field called choice architecture. Uh, choice architecture is one of those euphemisms, but what it means is that big brains of the Nobel Prize winning uh, uh, type of IQ who think they're smarter than you and I are going to make decisions for us using uh, exploiting our behavioral biases to get us to do things kind of un, unthinkingly. And I'll give you a very concrete example. It's, it's a well-known example in the field. So let's say you're a new employee and it's your first day on the job and the HR person gives you uh, your sign-up kit, you know, all the forms you have to fill out. And one of them says, um, we have a 401k plan and here's the brochure and would you like to join it? And you can check yes or no. Now, I redesign the form and I say, we have a 401k plan. Here's the brochure. You're in it. Would you like to opt out, not be in it? Yes or no? Well, it's kind of the same question. Are you in or are you out? And granted, you do have a choice. But the first question gets about 20, 25% participation. The second question gets 80% participation. In other words, same choice, 
but you can raise participation from 20% to 80% simply by flipping from opt uh, opt in to opt out. Uh, meaning I put you in it un unbeknownst to you and you have to elect to get out of it. That gets a much higher participation rate. Well, it turns out that the reason that's true is that it has nothing to do with 401ks. It has to do with people just don't like to fill out forms. People don't like to take the time and effort to check an extra box. Well, there's an example of choice architecture where that wasn't random. Some psychologist hired by probably Wall Street, maybe a bank, maybe the employer itself, uh, was asked to design the form to maximize participation. Well, there's kind of an a priori assumption there, which is, you know, participation must be a good thing. And people are kind of too dumb to make smart choices. So we're going to make the choice for them and steer them in that direction by exploiting their behavioral biases. Um, everything I just said is, is, is untrue. And it was, it's all happening. But who says 401ks are good? Who says that's the right choice? What makes you think that just because you have a Nobel Prize, you're smarter than I am? In fact, my experience with PhDs, uh, uh, PhDs in economics is it's a bit of a handicap because you can't see the real world. Um, but it's going on all the time. And I, and so I have a long chapter about that and I, I explain how it works. And the point I make to readers is that um, the key to dealing with this is education. You have to, first of all, you know, brush up a little bit on behavioral psychology, which is not hard to do. There are a number of good books on the subject, which I, I write about in my book, um, but be aware of it. And then next time you're filling out an application for insurance or, uh, a mortgage or a 401k or wh whatever, as you go through these questions, stop and think about them and ask yourself, am I being steered into something and is it a good thing? And then just to top it off, I give an example. I have two hypothetical people, uh, Susie and John, um, and, you know, women are smarter than men. So I made Susie, you know, the one that would make the right decision. But basically, uh, they both, they're the same age. They join two different companies on the same day. They make the same salary. Susie elects not to join the 401k and John elects to join the 401k. They work for 10 years. They retire. Uh, Susie has what she has and John takes his withdrawal. Um, but Susie invested 100% in gold. She had to pay her taxes as she went along, but the rest invested 100% in gold. John invested 100% in stocks, got the withdrawal, paid his taxes on the back end. Anyway, long story short, Susie has more money in my example uh, based on uh, I had a start date of 2000 and an end date of, uh, I believe, 2018 when I you know, kind of finished writing the book. So it was it was a 20 year example. And I, I say, look, these examples, you can make them come out any way you want. You can cherry pick your entry dates and your exit dates and, you know, pick gold when it's low and sell when it's high. And the fact is we had a major bear market in gold in the middle of my example. So I think it was done fairly. But, you know, in all honesty, you can you can. Uh, you know, structure those examples to get any result you want. But that wasn't the point. The point was, here was a real world example where the uh, the egghead advice, the, the the PhD advice was wrong. Uh, and who are they to use behavioral psychology to manipulate the outcome? Right? So it's kind of a warning to people to look out for that. But that's what's going on in 401ks. People are being steered into it, herded into it, uh, overweight equities, because guess what? That's what Wall Street sells. This is not about your well-being. This is about Wall Street getting commissions. Uh, this is about uh, you know managers getting uh, you know wrap fees, administration fees, and so forth. Not necessarily in your best interest. When it comes to investing, you believe that in the future, the, short, the near future, active investing is going to be advantageous over passive investing. I think a lot of people would be interested to hear why you believe that. Well, uh, that's right. And I make the distinction between active and passive investing. Um, the fact is, uh, you know, passive investing it ha is a fairly short history. It goes back to the 1970s. You know, Jack Bogle uh, invented the, uh, the Vanguard index fund, and that was the be kind of the beginning of passive investing and spread from there. Uh, and the metaphor I use is, um, you know, if one mosquito lands on the back of an elephant, what happens? Well, the mosquito gets a good meal and the elephant doesn't notice. But if a million mosquitoes land on the back of an elephant, the elephant dies. Um, and so the same is true with passive investing. That When the first people started doing it, they were free riding 
on the market. They were free riding on active investors who committed capital, made two-way markets, et cetera. They were one mosquito on the back of the elephant. And and fees were lower. And uh, the, the attitude was, hey, you can't beat the market. You cannot beat the market. Most active investors actually don't beat the market. And so just come along for the ride. And there'll be ups and downs. But if you're a buy, hold investor and you wait long enough, you'll do just fine with low fees and don't sweat the details. Well, that was the pitch. A lot of that was true at the beginning. But as with a lot of things, um, they they can start out true and become false as in what physicists call phase transition or a critical threshold is crossed. And my view is we've now crossed the critical threshold where the passive investing dominates over the active investing, not to mention the fact that 90% of the trading on the New York Stock Exchange is, is uh, robots. And when I say robots, I'm not talking about order matching systems where, you know, you're a seller and I'm a buyer, but we want anonymity and we put our orders into a computer and the computer matches us up, matches us up. That's been around since the nineties. I'm talking about robots actually making decisions based on algorithms where the robot decides whether to buy or sell or how much, et cetera, based on a pre-programmed algorithm saying, do this at this level, scan the newspapers, look for keywords, no human involvement at all. So now we have this uh, kind of witch's brew of passive investors not really paying attention to fundamentals or markets or technicals because they're not supposed to. They just buy the stocks with the active markets, so-called consisting of robots. Um, so now what happens if there's a break in the market? And there always is a you know, significant crash. What happens? Well, passive investors call their brokers and say, get me out and get me the cash. I don't want to lose any more money. Well, that means the passive fund managers have to sell the stocks to get the cash to redeem the investor. Well, what happens when you sell stocks in a declining market? It declines more. You know, as you're selling into a collapse and it's collapsing even more. In the old days, that's where the active investors would step up and say, hey, okay, this is low enough. I'm a buyer. You know, and they, they would be the other side of the market. But the active investors are few and far between. And if they're robots, they're just going to turn themselves off because they haven't been programmed for this. And the market's going to go no bid and go straight down. So that's that's the danger. This is no longer peaks and valleys. This is jumping off a cliff, a five thousand dollar rock face, and uh, you know you're not going to have a very uh, very happy ending to that. So um, so I tell people, you know, if you're in a passive fund, uh, you know, be prepared for an utter collapse because the market will go no bid. If you're an active investor, um, you need to be nimble, and you can beat the market. There are ways to do it. It's not easy, I'm not, and most active investors. Don't do it. Don't beat the market. I explain why in the book, but explaining why also kind of unlocks the key to how you actually can beat the market. The title of your book is Aftermath. And even though it does focus on a financial crisis, which you believe will happen in the near future, uh, the title does speak to rebuilding, trying to, I guess, bring society, at least financially, back to a point at which it's healthy. What do you think the most important coping mechanism will be for people in the aftermath of another economic quagmire? Well, there are two parts, uh, two answers to that question. One is, um, you know, one of the questions I'm asked most frequently is, you know, people will read my books or hear a presentation I'm giving and they'll say, OK, Jim, I understand. the I, I kind of agree with you. But, you know, could you call me three o'clock the day before and I'll sell my stocks and buy some gold? And I say, uh, well, first of all, I'm not going to know the day. I'll tell you that right now. I know it's coming. I know how bad it'll be. Not because I have a crystal ball. I don't, but because there are physics and mathematics behind it. You can model this and see how bad it will be. But I won't know the day it comes, number one. Number two, even if I did, I'd probably be a little busy that day. But more to the point, if you wait until the panic starts, it'll be too late to do anything about it. Uh, what I say to people is, what are you waiting for? Why aren't you preparing now? It's like, you know, buying hurricane insurance when, when the roof of your house just blew off in a hurricane. You buy it beforehand. You buy it when, when you know, the sun is shining. So there, there are concrete things you can do right now to prepare for this. And uh, I recommend an allocation to gold and silver. Physical bullion, not, not ETFs, not gold futures, because those aren't gold. Those are contracts having to do with gold that will be terminated or suspended early in a crisis. So get, get physical bullion, uh, you know, put it in a safe place. Um, I also recommend a large allocation to cash and people are surprised to hear that they go, wait a second, Jim, you're, you're the one talking about the death of the dollar. 
uh, why would I want cash? And the answer is, well, you might not want it forever, but it's very good to have now. It reduces volatility in your portfolio, so you can kind of sleep at night, but it has huge embedded optionality, and people don't know how to, don't really appreciate the value of the optionality. If I said, hey, I'll sell, I'll sell you an out-the-money call option on every asset class in the world, you know, what would you pay me for? You say, well, that sounds pretty valuable. Well, that's what cash is. You know, in a panic, you know, the best description I ever heard of a panic is everybody wants his money back. You know, people think they have money. They say, oh, I have money in the stock market or I have money in real estate. No, you don't. You have stocks and you have real estate. Oh, you want money? Well, you got to sell it and get the money if you can. And in a crashing market, it's more and more difficult to do that. But, you know, money is, is money. It's not things denominated in money. Well, if you're the one with cash and everything's falling apart, you can take a deep breath, take a couple steps back, look at the landscape, and at some point go shopping. You can be the one who, you know, picks up all the bargains. And there's no better example of that than our friend uh, Warren Buffett. Um, if you look at the balance sheet of Berkshire Hathaway, they have $115 billion in cash, the most cash they've ever had. Why? Because Warren Buffett sees what I see, which is uh, a collapse coming and the person with cash will be, be able, to, able to buy anything they want. Um, so that's one. Um, so get your gold now. Uh, you know, when gold's going up $100 per ounce per day, day after day, um, and you everyone's like, oh, get me some gold. You know, well, sorry, the dealers are not going to return your phone calls. Uh, the mints are going to be back ordered. You're not going to be able to get it. It's not a question of price. They just won't have any. Get some now. Uh, get some silver now. Build up your cash reserves now. Don't try selling assets into a panic and prepare now. So that's one set of uh, one one you know concrete set of advice, a uh, bit of advice. The other one is um, what I call the barbell portfolio, and I talk about this in the book. So the point is, if I told you we were definitely going to have an inflationary world. You would know exactly what to do. You'd buy gold, land, hard assets, you know, et cetera, uh, and you're ready for the inflation. If I told you we were going to have a deflationary world, you would know exactly what to do. You get more cash. Cash becomes more valuable in deflation. Uh, you get 10-year treasury notes because in deflation, interest rates come down, which produces capital gains on the notes, et cetera. But what if I said it could be either one? Or what if I said it could be both in sequence? You could first have a severe bout of deflation followed by extreme inflation as a policy response. You have to be ready for both. And that's what I call the barbell. You have the two ends of the barbell. So over here, you have your inflation hedges, which are you know gold, silver, fine art, land, and natural resources. Over here, you have your deflation hedges, which are um, a 10-year treasury notes would be the best example. And then uh, utility stocks, if you like. And then in between, connecting the two sides of the barbell is your cash, which, again, reduces volatility and gives you optionality. So that's a, a model asset allocation to prepare for what's coming. The third thing uh, I would suggest is um, what will life be like in the aftermath? Uh, it, it's not the end of the world, but it could be, as I said earlier, it could be a different world. It might look more agrarian. It might look more like... Uh, you know, um, uh, I use uh, uh, Thornton Wilder's Our Town, uh, Grover's Corners, New Hampshire, in, in 1901. Uh, the, you know, they had uh, they had uh, the, the telephone, they had uh, uh, early forms of cars, but they had a lot of farms and uh, small town life. And uh, you know, people got along fine, but um, you know, not as you know, might not have been electrified, not the digital world we live in today. And um, but another vision is. Um, and here I would point to a very, very talented writer, Lionel Shriver. Uh, she, uh, she wrote a book, I think it was called We Have to Talk About Kevin, which has turned into a very successful movie. But her most recent book um, was called The Mandibles. And it's a story of four generations of the same family, but they're all alive at the same time. There's a, it's kind of a 95-year-old patriarch and a 70-year-old son and a, a 30-year-old you know, granddaughter and a couple of teenage kids. And um, but they're living in the aftermath of a global financial panic of the kind I'm describing. And uh, I, I won't kind of give away the book. It's well worth reading, extremely well done. But she says, well, you know, people still have jobs, but not all of them. A lot of people got laid off. A lot of the more high end people got laid off tenure faculty and they moved in with the sister who was, uh, you know, a, a high school teacher in the public school system or whatever. 
Um, there are police around, but they only work for pay. You got to go out and pay them to protect your house. Um, the supermarkets are open, but there's almost nothing on the shelves. And you might buy uh, a jar of uh, steel bolts and you wanted some food. But uh, why would you buy the steel bolts? Well, there was no food. But if the steel bolts, somebody else might want those later and I'll find them and swap them for some food. So it's almost like barter material um, and so forth. And so, uh, you know, the water is only on one day a week and, you know, you get used to not bathing and uh, and so forth. So uh, so the point is life goes on. It's not the end of the world. It looks kind of familiar looking around, but it's very, very different. And an example of that, a more extreme example, would be Venezuela. And by the way, Venezuela is happening now. It's not uh, It's not science fiction. So um, I give a lot of credit to uh, uh, Lionel Shriver for envisioning this. Um, she was very kind in uh, her book to reference uh, my first book, Currency Wars. And I returned the favor a little bit in the, the last chapter of uh, – aftermath by making reference to this scenario. So there are a couple of different ways it can play out, but the main point is uh, get ready now. And the final question is, I think you give us some pretty solid reasons thus far, but is there any reason that you haven't given this to why people should buy your book? Say the average American who really is, doesn't have a sophisticated understanding of politics or economics or anything like that. Why should they spend the time and of course the money on your book? How would it benefit him or her? Well, uh, thank you. It's a great question. And it's something that as a writer, you you think about while you're writing the book. Obviously, you hope it sells. And by the way, we are a, uh, a Wall Street Journal bestseller and a national bestseller. So it's had a very good uh, run, a lot of good reviews. And, uh, you know, of course, as a writer, you, you hope for that. But but as you're writing, you're saying to yourself, well, um, is this going to resonate with the reader? Am I going to communicate with the reader? Uh, and it's the fifth book I've written on economics. And the one thing I absolutely did not want to do is write a textbook. I have no interest in writing a textbook. And the problem with most economists is, first of all, they don't write very many books. There are some exceptions. Uh, Barry Eichengreen, Paul Krugman, are, and some others have written a few books. Um, but mostly they write articles, academic articles, that are really, really hard to read. So what I try to do, uh, I do not dumb down the material. But I, I kind of take PhD level material, but I present it in plain English, which is not hard to do. Not hard for me to do. It's going to be very hard for, for PhD academic economists to do. If you do it in plain English, tell some stories, use metaphors, use some narrative technique. It's amazing how much uh, really high level economics you can convey to the everyday reader. And I, I hear that a lot and I take it um, you know, very much as a compliment. It's meant as a compliment. People say, you know, Jim, I, I stumbled through economics in college, didn't get it, read some books, never understood. Yours is the first book that I read where thank you, and I really understand what's going on. And again, that's for me the, the sort of no higher, um, no higher compliment. So, so I would suggest to readers or potential readers that it's very accessible. Um, you know, you pick it up and read it, and I think it'll be very clear. And I write it that way, but it, the material is not dumbed down. We're 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 trying to use use plain English to deal at a very high level, but it is, it is understandable. And then beyond that, um, I think, uh, you know, we mentioned some of the things already. I have a whole chapter on debt and deficits. That's a, that's a topic that'll make most people's eyes glaze over, but I present it in historical framework, going back to George Washington. I mean, people say, well, you know, gee, the national debt, uh, it started with George Washington and it's been going up ever since. And now it's $23 trillion. Well, it is $23 trillion, but it did not go up in a straight line. As a matter of fact, uh, we had a national debt before we had a nation. When George Washington was sworn in, we already had some national debt. Uh, they didn't know how to pay it. And the Congress said default on it. And Alexander Hamilton said, no, why don't we borrow some more money, pay off the old debt and then borrow more and pay off the new debt and just keep going. And that was the invention of the government bond market. And it's been around 230 years. So, uh, so when you put it in that context, you can see that debt grows in times of war and is reduced in times of peace so that it stays in bounds. And that was true until 2000 and uh, President Bush 43 and President Obama. So Bush, uh, when, when Bill Clinton left office, there was $5 trillion of debt. Bush doubled it to $10 trillion. Obama doubled it again to 20 trillion and Trump's added on a couple trillion more. So that's how you get to your, your 23 trillion. So we really are off the rails, but again, by putting it in historical context, 
um, familiar figures like, you know, Abe Lincoln and FDR. It, it makes it readable. So I think there's a lot there. Um, it's very accessible. Uh, and we got an election coming up and people need to be informed. And I think you'll, you'll come away from the book uh, and all of a sudden things won't seem so uh, mysterious. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. See you next time.